first of all, I would like to thank you uh, uh, for the organizers for allowing us to have a, a talk. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh to all uh, listeners, viewers uh, from all over Malaysia. Aso Datuk Kamazaman is there too. Hi Datuk, Assalamualaikum. Okay, let, let me introduce uh, this talk today. Uh, I have Bro Nicholas Kazmael with me here in front of, actually in front of me, <laughs> we're in the same room. Uh, Prof. Kazmer is a paleontologist at the Utbos University in, in Budapest, Hungary, uh, uh, in Eastern Europe. Uh, he has about 40 years experience in teaching paleontology, uh, but his research is not limited to paleontology. He's more keen on paleo paleogeography, and he, uh, as well as Mesozoic uh, tertiary, such, uh, he did some uh, such, studies. Uh, studies on, on uh, relics of uh, ancient relics uh, uh, all over, not all over the world, in Europe <laughs> and as well as in Asia. He's been quite familiar to UKM actually, uh, but uh, because he has been there. Uh, looking for uh, sea notches last time with me and uh, we, we uh, got the camera and the charges and we, we went also to see the, the seashells on top of the uh, Gopi Nang and so on. And then he has something, uh, some ideas about this. Uh, we, can, we can talk later. The topic that he will deliver, he, I asked him about uh, the topic. Is he gave me two topic. So I think, I think we let him uh, uh, talk about both. The first topic will be on hypogenic cast in Peninsula mm -hmm. Malaysia, uh, implication for active tectonics. And the second one will, on, will be on the seashell on the mountain tops, all of in water spouts, sediment located at high location in Langkawi. We can uh, start with uh, Prof. Kazmir. Uh, to, to uh, you, up to you. Uh, how, how much you want to spend on the first topic and the second topic? Maybe uh, you have for, for forty-five minutes, fifty minutes together all together. Please. Thank you very much, Professor Shafia, for the good word. I promise you, I will not be very long. I will try to adapt myself to this new system of talking into a with a headset and microphone. It's first experience in my life. Aha. Uh -huh. Now I cannot hear the, the echo very good now. Thank you. So, <laughs> Mr. Dear colleagues, it's a very great pleasure for me to return to, to Southeast Asia after a break of like three years caused mostly by the COVID. And I hope if I can again next time, I will meet the community of, of UKM in person as well. What I will show you this time is uh, how how the, how is i hope there are also students present not only colleagues not only faculty i want to show you how does the making a plan in science how does it fail but still how does it bring spectacular results i will show you two examples both of them started with a study when we were years ago we went to see marine notches. Some of them, you are familiar with it. These are the features on the coast and in, in carbonate coast, which are like between low tide and high tide and the deep cavity-like feature on all along the carbonate coast of Malaysia, especially in Thailand. And we wanted to see how the, if and how do they reflect any sea level change, either by eustatic waves or by coastal tectonics. We, did, we didn't really find them, but we found something totally different. And this is a great warning for science administrators when you, they want you to give a plan to work for on it for like four years, and they want you to, to put down all the results of this plan in the grant proposal, then something totally different will come out. So if you can share, now should I share the screen again? Because I did it already once. The story, this is a nice international team. Some of them has been living here for all his life. Professor Shafia, I am a, have been a frequent visitor in the past 10 years. And Mr. Christoph Geisig, my best friend in geology, he is 
eager to come again here, but we think a lot together on these topics. We look for marine notches where there is biological erosion, where bivalves and sea urchins and sponges bore into the rock and leave traces, which are great to mark sea level and which can be fossilized. But what we found was something totally different in the hills of, Kel of Perlis and Kedah. In the hills of Perlis and Kedah, we found spelleo notches, notches and caves, which in shape look like very much the marine notches, but they do not bear any evidence for biological activity. We studied these, <clears throat> these caves in a short time. Actually, we spent also the past four days studying them again. And the story will be how and if they are associated somehow with the thermal springs of the region for tectonic and anything which is a nice forward-looking hypothesis, but which you are very much uh, welcome to criticize. Yeah. So these are just, I mentioned the marine notches. Here are some photos on the left. I think, yes, it's from Riley in Thailand, where you, if you go close, you see the lots of boreholes in the rock made by mostly by lithophaga boreholes. And then they are excellent sea level markers. So this is what we found. We found deep notches, which we thought originally they are marine notches, but we found that many of them, too many of them, one above the other, with very spectacular forms. The notches were much, much bigger than what you ever see on the seashore. They were like, you can see from the sitting man, it's like two meters high. Even there are two notches kind of amalgamated into one. The upper one is like maybe 40 centimeters high. The lower one is one meter high on the right. And it extends into the hill several meters which is practically impossible to do it by sea erosion, by, in the wave, by the wave action of the sea. So what, are, what other features are here? These are multiple deep notches. This is a huge notch <clears throat> in Guacalong, which is like you can walk through here. It's one and a half meters high, very smooth float. Okay, it's mostly from the children playing there, but still the roof is totally flat. This is a corrosion table of floor and flat. And this one, okay, this was just is being excavated by local priests, I think, to make that a temple in the cave, just removing the sediments which filled it up. This means also that these notches are very, very long, very, very old, probably older than what you see along the seashore, which are supposed to be probably Holocene only age. So this is covered by cave sediments. And uh, you often there are many generation of case sediments, so this can cover, can fill up very well sediments. This would be for the young generation, this would be a very good topic for stratigraphy to excavate these cave filling sediments, find the bones in them, and also the rodent teeth in them, and date them, give them a date. It's a wonderful history, part of the history of the earth preserved in caves. There are some caves which have very smooth walls and very, very smooth ceilings there. They are well uh, prepared for tourism, so it's easy to make the photos there. And this is one, again, it's a crazy thing. You see inter notches, like half notches, so not a half circle, but a quarter circle in cross section, but one, many of them one above the other. In this case, in Gunung Rapat, you see like one, two, three, four, five, up to six notches, one above the other. So what the hell it is, how it is formed. And we have the suggestion that these notches are not marine notches, not made by uh, wave abrasion or wave action or biological action, but these are made kind of how to say, I can say chemical notches. The notches which were made underground into the depths of the karst, where the ca groundwater in the karst was intersecting or touching with the, with the air. So the water-filled part of the porosity was meeting with the air-filled part of the porosity. And somehow this groundwater level uh, uh, aggressively eroded the rock. The erosion is usually enhanced in this situation by carbon dioxide which comes with the water, with the groundwater, and with hydrogen sulfide, H2S, which makes the groundwater very aggressive. It's a kind of sulfuric acid, which with time in geology, 
even if we don't have data, we, we have always have a lot of time for action, maybe in thousands or millions of years, it can etch the rock and create huge cavities. And I will show you some features where the etchings is was made underground, so in a phreatic condition below the groundwater level. These notches or half notches or quarter notches were made at the groundwater level, probably. And there is there are some features which were made above groundwater level in the air field porosity, in the air field karstic porosity of the region. This is like okay, this is again a notch, a corrosion table, which is actually by chance it is uh, Kedah, it's not far from the sea, it's practically at the sea level. There is some little small river flowing through this one. This is so I tell you, there are three, three different groups of features. The features are the uh, phreatic, the, which is under, underwater, the epiphreatic, which is the meeting point of the phreatic and the vado zone, and the karst features made in the vado zone. With the vado zone features, everyone is probably familiar who has been in a cave, all the stalactites, stalagmite, travertine, flowstone, everything was formed in the Vedo zone, so in cavities which were filled by air. This is the, the zone which is towards phreatic, in the phreatic zone, so totally filled by, by water. And this looks like the Swiss cheese. Okay, this comparison is not very good in Asia, where there is not much culture of cheeses, but in Europe it's very well understood. There are the Emmental cheese, which has huge cavities, huge bubble-like cavities. There are almost more cavities in the cheese than cheese itself. So this is like direct holes in every direction, horizontally cavited, vertical, like here, it's horizontal cavity. This is a vertical cavity. And there are smaller cavities crossing, connecting each other. So this feature was formed below the vado, below the groundwater table in the vado zone and you must be and but we can study them only when it has been uplifted into the it was formed in the phreatic zone but we can study it we can enter these cavities we can study these cavities only when it enters the vado zone when it becomes a cave what we call a cave which is volcable by, by humans it's rerun the previous slides. No, sometimes I jumped here and there. Sorry, it was not always forward. Yes. This is an inter notches on the ceiling. This is a battle, battle caves next door to each to us here. When you go there next time, see the caves beyond the, beyond the Hindu temples that are, look up to the roof and you will see very strange half circular or looks like the half moon shaped cavities in the roof of the cave of the cavity. This was formed when still all the cavity was filled by water, by hydrogen sulfide containing aggressive water, and it, it, it uh, excavated slowly dissolving specific roles. I am a bit vague about the formation of these features because actually no one knows how are they formed. No one made an experiment in a better soluble material. No one made not even computer experiment was made, but I'm not sure if they are really described nature very well. One is to make analog experiment to know how are they formed. The main way of formation is that there is porosity in the karst underground. It's filled by aggressive water and the aggressive water is moving through very slowly in this rig. And the slow movement, it forms eddies. So small rotating water bodies, which stay at the same place in an almost steady condition, and these eddies erode, chemically erode the rock, the limestone itself, making these, these features. So everything, this is not, these are not caves, these are just uh, uh, solution features. When the water flowing along the fissures, it makes the fissures wider from a millimeter to makes a few decimeter wide and it dissolved the rock. So it, again, this everything what you see here as porosity was formed underwater in phreatic conditions. This is another beautiful notch. Probably the water was flowing from below to the, to the up through a gaps, the so-called rift, it's just a, it's not a real oceanic rift, it's just a, a, a wide fissure. And at some point, 
the fissure was widened to form the notch, probably at the, the groundwater level at that time. This, when the dissolution is going on for a long time and meters and meters of rocks disappear from the wall of the caves, something stays behind, remains. And this is kind of uh, remaining when a piece of rock is like a protruding from the wall by one and a half meter and then become wider up and down. So it's, it's a very strange something, it's just floating in air. The elevation of this rock, piece of rock is from here to here like one and a half meter and you see a notch behind, a cave notch behind. Keels, we again don't know how to, as they form, they are vertical features, very sharp edges here, bordered by two sets of these uh, half moon-like etch, etching features. So now I just let me introduce the word, which probably you know, the hypogenic story. Hypogenic word means that the water, which makes this, uh, dissolves this material, dissolves the limestone, it comes from below. It comes from below, probably warmer than the environment because the down there is, a, according to the hydrothermal gradient, dissolves the story and then removes the material into the probably surface springs or elsewhere. So there are keys. Again, these are sim, uh, some symbols, evidences for this underwater hypogenic formation of caves. This is again, this looks like notches, but not really notch. Okay, we don't really know. Even the nomenclature is not, not uniform. Every country and every author use different names and there is a huge mess. One should make a good order here. Where several, there was a slow eddy was forming, rotating here and carving into this uh, uh, circular cavity. Yes, we were just there. This is again notches. So, Water, tab water table features, water table, a ledge just floating in air like 20 centimeter uh, thick, but almost a meter wide ledge floating into this lateral. Now, this is a very good, this is the only one feature, the scallops, which most people agree that it was from underwater in hypogenic condition. These are very shallow cavities on the wall of a cave. It's like, can be two, three meters diameter, but only 10, 10 to centimeter deep. Very, very shallow one. Again, a kind of stable, steady eddies formed there, dissolving them in a cavity, which was totally filled by aggressive, probably warm water. And some keel again, or pendant. Again, the names are not, the morphological names are not uniform. And here you see what is, how do, we see it on the surface, this story. There are many, many hot springs in Malaysia. Some of them are very beautiful resorts. And this is the north, northern one of them I am aware of is in Langkawi Island. And the southernmost one is in Singapore, where they are seriously considering making some geothermal energy from their hot water. These springs are up to, are almost like uh, boiling water, so hot. To have this water on the surface naturally means that you need either a volcano nearby, which heats it up like in Japan, but there is no active volcano in, in Malaysia. Or you need a very thin crust of the earth. It's like in Hungary where we have lots of hot natural hot waters, but the crust is only 26 kilometers thick. Malaysia is normal 30, 35 to 40 kilometers. Again, it doesn't help. So what is the origin of so much hot water? Definitely geothermal energy, but why is it, how come this water come, can come so close to the surface? This is the way how hot water can come to the surface. This is actually, it's a, it's a computer model made for Hungary, but I think it can be applied to, to Malaysia as well. Consider this as the mountains of West Malaysia and a flat plain to the west. So this. This is a cross section, an east west cross section of this line. Here are the mountains, and here are the, here is the tidal plain. And there, between them, probably there is a fault zone, even if you don't see it, probably there is a fault zone, which lets a lot of hot water approach the surface. So there's a hydrological circulation coming from here at a very deep one, which brings up the heat from the, inter from the depths. Considering that the average ground temperature here is 24 degrees or higher 
plus adding just an average global geothermal gradient of 35 kilometers, you means that it already at two kilometer depths, you will find a hydrothermal water reservoir, which when there is a possibility to reach the surface, like in an open fault, it will come to the surface. We don't know, and this is uh, very, it is a question for the local geologist. Are there any open faults which bring up the hot water or the water just comes through the already karstified region? This is a good question. I have no idea how to answer it. Okay, there are the springs, what you have seen, single up to 300 meter elevation, up to almost 100 degrees and so on. It's not so important. So the springs go along from Langkawi all along this coast and even there are some springs down in Singapore. If it is the same fault zone or not, I have no idea, but it is just very conspicuous that you have so many, like 100 hot springs, very neatly studied by people from University of Ultra, Malaysia. So what did we find here? What is the story about? There is karst in this region, so lots of limestone, lots of cavities, karst. This karst was made, formed underwater in under hypogenic condition by aggressive groundwater. There are many hot springs, sulfurous springs in this region, in the karst region of Malaysia. And these hot springs are probably the, the evidence for an ongoing hypogenic processes down there, down the ground in the, in the earth, which means these caves are still being formed down there, maybe at one, two, three kilometer depth. And part of this, and it's very suspicious that East of this zone, east of this line of falls, of or no, line of uh, springs, there's high mountain up to two, two kilometer elevation, and west of it is just the the plain, the tidal plain of the out of the form, the Holocene plain of Malaysia where you live. So this is big difference. It can mean, could mean that there is some kind of uh, diff tectonic processes going on, the mountains are being uplifted and the plains are being, uh, low, being lowered. So that could be, okay, this is a definitely provocative sentences here, that the linear arrangement of springs suggests that there are active forces that exist, probably not just one, but many small magnets and so on and so on. So this was the first story. Uh, it was more provocation, it was very few facts and a lot of provocations to provoke discussion and maybe provoke young people to find something, go into structural geology, into this kind of hydrogeology, or just in a general way of, uh, of studying caves, which are pretty much understood in Malaysia, in the peninsula, compared to Sarawak and Sabah. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, uh, Prof. Uh, Kasmir. I, I think we we leave the question at, at the end. You can you you want to have a break? No, you can yeah, continue. Okay. Can, can you continue with the second yes, paper? I, I think the second paper will be more interested <laughs> for for the, for for the audience. And, and it's a fancy title. This story is not so provocative. It's much well founded, much more well founded in geology. Seashells on the mountain. Top is just a big uh, <clears throat> book on the a popular book on the history of life of Nikolaus Steno, who was who was the founder of uh, crystallography and historical geology and stratigraphy and so on. The story is about the Langkawi Island, where again, with the team of uh, Prof. Shafia and uh, Kam Professor Kamal and Ch Professor Chaz, this event a few years ago, just to look for marine notches. And what did they find instead? The, these professors made me climb very steep hill, which was I not really prepared. Okay, these are some locations, and we found very strange sediment, seashells, actually shell-rich sand on very high elevation above sea level. There is a common understanding that modern sea level was a bit undulating, oscillating, and in the mid Holocene there could be some higher sea level, which is up to four meters higher than today. But this one is a bit really too high, and the sediment is very, very young, very, very well preserved. I will show you what is there. This is the location. There are cliffs, overhanging cliffs. Below the cliffs, there is hanging some stalactite outside the cave, outside the cave, actually just even there is no cave. And below that, you will see 
here, you can see that there is some uh, two and a half meter thick uh, sand with lots of uh, sea of seashells and other kind of organisms. This is like there is a, it's attached. The sediment is attached to rock. The rock is oh, if I would remember chopping limestone maybe. And these are some not very layered but a bit arranged uh, horizontally arranged beds. And this is very few of them. This, some of them, the sediment is in caves, filling caves, which is a bit interesting to see uh, 60 meter above sea level as uh, marine sediments with a cave fill. And here you can see the organisms, the seashells. Some of them are even with double valves. And I will give you an interesting interpretation for having double valves here. This is the sediment again, looks like very boring on the side, but it's super interesting. Here you can see, again, it's protected. It was overgrown by the stalactite. So probably the stalactite had a role of preserving these sediments high in the sea, sea level. So what is, this was a feature. Okay, this was a very short tip. We had no idea what did we find, and it came out much later, years later, by reading uh, papers, everything, that what could be good. So the animals, the fossils, what we find here were corals. This is of Acropora coral, plus and sometimes encrusted by oysters, which was, of course, said it came from a coral reef. We found uh, gastropods, telescopium, sacostrea shells again, which were originally lived in a mangrove. Oh, that was a mistake. And we find Anadara and Venus shells, which lived in the general on the shallow sea. We found epibentos fossils, which were just living on top of the sediment, and inventic fossils, which were living within the sediment. The most interesting thing was that these shells next to the cliff, attached to the cliff, were not abraded at all, maybe not even broken, very much intact, indicating that they were deposited living in a low energy environment. We found the Murex gastropod shell, which was complete with spines. These spines are very vulnerable, broke up easily. And still it was preserved, embedded in this otherwise very rough, very uh, large grain size sediment. The bivalves, the seashells were convex side up. This indicates a high energy deposition from a high energy environment. And we found double valves, which means that the animals were transported and buried while still alive and the muscles holding together the both wells. So what? But there was something only one thing. There was no fauna of a rocky shore. There was no boreholes, no any bioerosion on the rocky shore, and nothing which was normally living there. So what is this? Low energy environment, high energy environment, and and animals buried alive, buried in one environment within one sixty centimeter seagull shell bed. So not rocky shore, not a coquina, not a luna shell. What the hell it is? The age is like uh, 60, it is six to seven, no, five to 6,000 years old. So it's like a bit before the middle of the Holocene. So what happened here 6,000 years ago? Uh, most people would say it's a mid-Holocene high sea level was there, but we know from many sites, including Singapore, Malaysia, from the words of Mr. Parham, that this was not never more higher than four meter above modern sea level. We could have rapid tectonic uplift, which, but let's make a quick calculation, 65 meters in 6,000 years uplift, which would mean 10 millimeter per year. Even the Himalaya doesn't grow 10 millimeter per, per year. In, an, in average. So, and the Langkawi is definitely not the Himalayan in tectonic activity. No, we don't have any earthquakes there. So a rapid tectonic uplift can be excluded. Okay, let's make, maybe the, it was caused by a tsunami. We know that the 2004 tsunami in Langkawi was maximum four meters high, but the, and rather these sides are on the protected side of the island. So the tsunami couldn't, couldn't send anything up them in any ancient tsunami up to 23 to 65 meters. Was it a storm deposit? Typhoons, super typhoons, we know that it's possible they can make very big gaze, but the problem is here, Blanca is very close to the mainland. And that means the storm doesn't have enough fetch to bring the really, to produce really high waves into it. So it's, it's a more than a few 
Certainly the waves are not more than 10 meters high in any kind of super typhoon. Even the water depth is very, very low in the Lankavi Strait, so it's maximum high, three meter high waves are possible. It's a simple physical calculation. A reviewer, okay, this paper was already submitted to sedimentary geology and very neatly kicked back saying that we forget about discussing Shell Midden. Shell Midden is an elegant archaeological word for kitchen rubbish, kitchen garbage. Okay, now the people that sell, they love seafood, they collected sea, okay, so they made it. Usually their kitchen was on the shore, not 65 meter elevation, but if there is a nice cave, okay. So you carry up your seafood, but why would you carry up balanids, uh, corals, and a lot of inedible organisms? You don't do that. You carry up only the, only the edible ones. So again, this is better to be excluded. There is some Anadara Bible. This is edible. This is very tasty, but it's far from being dominant in deposits. So probably this was not a shell middle, not a kitchen refuse. And there was also Bibles, quite a lot of Bibles. Both face closed. These were not eaten. They were just thrown out or what? So it doesn't. And this is shell middle elements are usually just uh, it's a garbage heap is positioned randomly. And these are upward concave shells. So what is it? Every potential alternative opinions can be excluded. So what is the hell it is? Okay, and there was, when we, when we met a paper described the New Zealand, a very interesting example. There is an Aurangi Island. They found a botanical expedition, not a geological expedition, found a, found a very nice, interesting barren part of the, of the island. We started at the seashore on the rocky platform and it extended hundreds of meters into the island, hundreds of oh, no, kilometers into the island being like 100 meter wide. And this one was, the forest was destroyed, bushes, trees were uprooted, and there were a lot of marine organisms was found on land. They found seagrass, seagrasses hanging from trees. They found boulders, big boulders, encrusted with oysters up to 45 meters above sea level. They found sea urchin skeletons just scattered randomly on the hillside. So the interpretation of these guys were the launch in 2006 that it was a tromba, a tornado, a water spout, which sucked water, siphoned water out of the sea and, uh, the, and deposited everything on the island as it crossed the island. Based on the transported borders, it was very huge. The borders, so it was a T5 tornado, a very serious one. So what happened in Lanka? If it takes this opinion about it, our tornado could be maybe better, or there is no border to measure its intensity. But there was a tornado which siphoned up seawater and sediments from the bottom of the sea, mixed everything together, coral reef, mangrove sand, everything was going on as it moved. And this, when it when it crossed the, to the land, it deposited its sediment load in straight up to two and a half kilometer thickness all over the island, or at least along its path on the island. But then the tornado in a few minutes left, and there was a lot of sediment covered, loose sediment, which was washed off by the tropical storm, even by the same the the same storm that produced the tornado or any storm during the next six thousand years. And it was preserved only in very special protected sites, below overhanging cliffs, within caves, what we have seen, and or covered by rapidly growing stalagmites here, so flow stores. So that's why this, okay, this locality is very rare. Probably there were many more tornadoes, and okay, there were many more tornadoes. We, we are, uh, it's a Further radiocarbon dating is ongoing, so I'm pretty sure that the three sites are not, are not the same in age, in geological age, so we shall find different ages. And so that it could be a kind of frequent feature, this kind of tornado and sedimentation. So what is the significance for geology? When we find seashore sediments, modern Holocene sediments, at a modern sea level, the routine interpretation is that there is, it is a high, uh, mid-Holocene high sea level, second interpretation, it is tectonic uplift. Or, so it means a kind of high sea level. So, but we need to know that uh, or, marine organisms on, on land 
can mean tectonic uplift, can mean Holocene high sea level, and can mean just a redeposition from the contemporary sea into high level, which cannot, and this meaning cannot be used either for sea level reconstruction or for tectonic reconstruction. How does this story look like when you are there? This is a photograph from the 18th century. It's a painting by Hoyt. He was the painter of the Cook expedition and they observed, he made sketches and then made the paintings at home later. And they observed even suffered tornadoes on the sea near, near Papua. And you can see the, the Cook, Captain Cook's tiny ship here, tiny means nine meter wide, compared to the tornado is still a baby, it's nothing. Can you imagine how much water and how much sediment can this tornado siphon up, bring it up into the clouds and then deposit on the island when it's moved? So this is probably what happened in Latka uh, 6,000 years ago. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Kazman, for the nice uh, presentation of the uh, reasoning of the what we see, what we can observe in the field. And, uh, and what has happened elsewhere in the world. Uh, maybe last week or last two weeks, there was a tornado in Malacca. Mm -hmm. some, some, somebody uh, sent on, I think in the, in the, in the, in the news, so, what sea spouts in Pulau Besar, Malacca. Maybe you can, see if there's any sea spout deposit yeah. on the island or not. We, can, we don't know. Uh, maybe, uh, I think we can open to questions now. If there's anybody want to raise a hand to, uh, to, to, to question, I can read uh, one or two questions. First from the organizer, uh, uh, Dr. Shabina, she couldn't be around. Uh, thank you anyway for the doctor to help us here. Uh, she, she has a question. What the spot sediment? Why not tsunami sediment? Maybe you have uh, explained it a bit just now. Maybe you can uh, yes, elaborate yes, a little bit more. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, tsunami, tsunami sediment is known to, to be very, okay. like very, very high waves, like in Banda Aceh. Tsunami sediments are, no, tsunami waves can be very high. Like in Banda Aceh, we know that it's what, like 25 meter high or even higher waves were washed away the city. Uh, Banda Aceh is op open to the seas. I mean, it's discussion saying that it's open to the Indian Ocean. So, and the, the sea floor is just in the proper size to, to create a very high wave. Langkawi is a very much protected area. So, the sediments, three of the, the three sides, two of them are on the face on the landward side, on the on the side on the eastern side towards the peninsula, and from that tsunami probably would not bring up so much. I can pretty easily imagine even 23 meter tsunami in a very unfavorable environment, like there was Kopi P in Thailand, where tsunami waves came, surrounded the island both from the north and the south, collided in the middle and killed 2,000 people. So it's not in, uh, unimaginable, but still... You uh, should expect it on the western side of the world. Yes, the I, I would rather yeah. expect it to have it on the other side. A modeling, a careful modeling, when people know the, the, the depth of the, the shape of the sleeve for, there are quite not simple, quite complicated models telling what kind of tsunami waves can be produced. But in 2004, which was the regular 500 year, every 500 year tsunami in this region, it produced only four meters of waves in Lankavi, which is compared to this side, it's negligible. Related to that, uh, uh, Mr. Ascuri, or here in oh, well known as Pachu, uh, he said he think 65 meters might be due to astrostatic effect. Could it be? Isostatic effects are regularly calculated for for the global ocean by a team of geophysicists, Kurt Lambeck in Australia, Jerry Mitrovica in US and Peltier in Canada. And the calculations say that the, the melting of Antarctic ice, it can, can have an effect on the sea level close to Antarctica, even tens of meters high, but in the tropics, so in the very far field, 
and we are just right in the topic next to the equator, this is not more than one meter maximum. Other kind, Professor Chia brought up some other kind of elements that the, which I'm not really familiar to interpret, that kind of somehow the gravity or the, the monthly processes are changing. But I think the, the ratio of this, the rate of these processes is much longer than just a few thousand years of the Holocene. But to tell the truth, I am not very well versed in this geophysical part. So the normal, the usual Atlantic, uh, Antarctica ice dictated eustatic processes do not produce more than one meter elevation change in the around the equator. Maybe I can I can add a little bit. If it is astrostatic, it will cover all over the area. It's not just one spot, isn't it? Yes, that, that's a good thing. Yes, yes. And so probably we would have more because this is because tropical rain affected and removed the sediment, but tornado anyway can de deposit sediments only in along its path, which is like 50 to 102 meter pass, not all over the island. Eustatic would bring, yes, more sediment and more generally distributed. Yes. For the, for the first uh, talk just now, again, so a question from um, Mr. Ashkuri Opachu. Uh, he mentioned about the Ketlok Tong's uh, uh, roof cave which is not flat, which is uh, highly undulated, highly uh, full of uh, cavities and so on. So he asked you if you can explain that maybe similar, more or, more or less similar to the hot spring Banjaran. It's more or less like that. Maybe. Interpreting the hypogenic caves and the forms is, a, is in a hot debate nowadays. No. And there, are, there is a very strong or very vocal school which says that this very beauty on the roof of the case, and it is not flat, but it's like it formed a half circular, half globular form, even a full globular form with a little opening at the bottom, is mostly by the by a steam effect. So vapor from the water level, from an open water level, is just somehow attacking, attracting aggressively, dissolving the ceiling. There were some I think computer models was made. I am not a great believer of computer modeling, but I think if someone would make an analogous model, just showing that aggressive water vapor can attack the roof and make make circular forms, it would be a nice evidence. So anyway, to modern understanding is that there is a distinction in forms between the phreatic and vados, and vados can be formed by vapor uh, precipitation and va and aggressive vapors of the water. So I am pretty weak in this process, but I think there is no there is no common understanding yet. Means it's a very it can be a very fruitful uh, research direction. Uh, it's a lot more to study, isn't it? <laughs> There's a lot more to study. Uh, I, I have I still have have received any direct question. You can you can directly question uh, Prof Kazmi. Please, anybody who would who, who would like to ask anything. And if you can contact me by email, if you type my name in Google, oh. you will find my home page with all the access data, all my papers, and just we can continue it in in writing. I'm very pleased to con. Actually, you all can can uh, speak your question to Prof. Prof. Kazemi. New question from Dominic Dosh. Uh, what could you, one learn from the detailed stratigraphy of the seashell sediment, mode of deposition, quick dumping of sediment from the water spouts? What does it do good for our geology? <laughs> what is it good? There should be done. Anyway, this, this study is still missing a detailed stratigraphic description. Maybe it could say that at one side there were probably more than one, more than one uh, uh, deposition effect from by, uh, by tornadoes because we found the, the sediment, the seashell sediment, and then it was covered by flowstone from a so precip precipitation, then uh, no, the, there was a, let's say a stalagmite surrounded by the sea, the seashells. Then there was a flowstone flowstone covering it. Another stalagmite was growing on top. So means 
but now every almost everything was washed away by the tropical rain, normal tropical monsoon rains. So probably there were two events, for example. And when we went there, we were looking for something else. We didn't really know what is that. So actually, I must admit, we did not dis make a proper stratigraphic log. I'm not sure if so many years later, I'm still in the condition of going up again because it needs some climbing on the rocks. But again, I am supporting young people to do this challenge and go there and make a really good, anyway, for like, for stratigraphy or like a deposition, just to make how much of the percentage of the shells with convex up shells, how much of the percentage of the double walls. This was a very cursory observation, very quick observation without the intention of describing a, a, a tornado sediment. So I would say it's, even the reviewers didn't comment on it. I know that it's not a very high quality. Please overpass us. Yes, a friend, uh, Dominic one was from Curtin University. Mr. Ascuri said that uh, he likes this steam effect, for example, the creation of the bell-shaped structures. I don't know. <laughs> would, you, would you like to comment? Bell-shaped structures, bell -shaped structures yeah. in the large cave. In cave, the problem of speleology is that there are thousands of people doing speleology, digging caves and mapping caves and being happy with that and very few geologists study caves. So there are very many opinions and very very few evidence proven. So this steam cave, there is this steam, steam story is maintained in textbooks, especially by Derek Ford, because he has seen a cave which was found in Hungary in the 1950s, so quite a long time ago. There were no photos remained, only handmade drawings, but it looks like very spectacular, like a, a, sea, a row of pearls, one above the other. And people just couldn't imagine anything else that it was produced by steam above a warm water table. But again, it's an, as I said, it's opinion. It's not an evidence, and unfortunately, this cave has been destroyed by Soviet army training, uh, artillery training. It was in the middle of the training field while Soviet Union occupied Hungary in the, after the first, uh, Second World War. So we cannot prove it is hard or not. I'm not. I don't believe it very much. Someone has to do it. Experiment. Does evaporating water bring up? Is it distilled water? As I think. Or does it bring up anything aggressive component, compound, which can then precipitate it on the surface and dissolve it? Needs experiment. These are at least 70% of the or of these uh, genetic explanations in speleology, in carbon speleology, are opinions. Only opinions, not more, unfortunately. But so it means need, the field is very much open. So we need geologists to, to do the experiments. Mm -hmm. Experiments. The speleologists very... didn't do the experiment. <laughs> no, they dig the cave, which is very useful for us. They just found a kind of a hypogenic case, ten kilometers from Budapest. No one knew about it, and it's, the room is like the Georgia Department can easily fit in the in the cave. Anybody else want to have a direct question, Prof. Ashkur, uh, Mr. Ashkuri, if you want to say something, Dato. Okay. Uh, Dominic here. Can you hear me? Yes. Dominic. I just want to thank uh, Professor Miklos for his uh, very interesting talk. Um, we met a couple of years back, and he's uh, in, certainly inspired some of my my very tentative research at, at NIA. And um, I have a burning question. It would be about what he's seen at NIA, and is he is he finding any evidence of hypogenic cast in the Sarawak region? Yes, there, Dominic. I didn't name each people whom I had the good luck for working and studying in Malaysia, but you, this few, I don't know, three, four days fieldwork was the most inspiring me. And actually, I did this little study in Malaysia and a very, even a smaller one in Budapest, just to, to gain the credibility to do to work to come to work with you on here because a huge cave and I'm just a small small scientist. I I need some background, otherwise the big guys will kick me out from this field. So I should like to refresh these stories with you. And yes, 
They were very beautiful, huge scallops, many, many things. I still have all the photos and we should just sometimes sit down and think about it, work about it. Actually, I will be in Malaysia until probably until mid-August, but we could, we could do something together, just sit and write. We, we can certainly have a, a, a meeting and talk things over. Now we're familiar with the online meeting mode. Yeah. And um, um, I, I have no background in hypogenic cast. I have a lot of speleological background in European alpine cast. And that's, I think, hindering me a little bit because I think you have uh, more experience from your cast in Hungary? No, no, I am not. I am just an out, I am an outlier or a newcomer in this field. I, I need the people of the, who has seen a lot, a lot more than me. And you have seen 10, 100 times more than me. And there are, some, there are hypogenic caves in the Alps as well. Yeah. I have some more ideas. It's true, just, true. <laughs> not, not even that undeveloped than those ones I presented here, that possible many of the caves are hypogenic. But okay, this needs more further development and discussion with someone who is on the opposite opinion. So I can formulate and mine and maybe reduce my bravery and just to be more modest. Now I am very active and aggressive in this field, but I don't need to okay. be. I think we need that. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much for your, your interesting talk. Um, I think this highlights something that I've always been saying to our student and, and anyone who wants to hear. Caves are fascinating. The yes. formation of the cave, the sediment deposited, and your example from Lankawi has really uh, illustrated that in a, in a very dramatic way. Uh, this water spout sediment would not have been preserved if it hadn't been for the cave yes. and the, the flow stone capping them. And that. I think uh, exactly. Dominic can, can talk to uh, Prof. Um, yes. Kazma later on, to communicate. Uh, yes, we, we, shall, we, shall, we shall refresh, we shall talk it and email chicken. Uh, during, I will be on Silver for the next uh, like one week and even during that. In the evening, we can do or just thank you very much, Dauphine, okay. for listening. Thank you. Hello, thank you. hello, nice prof. Talking to you. hello, prof. Yes, hello, hello, Askuri hello. here. Yes, you yes, can sir. hear me. Yes, I can. Okay, uh, uh, actually, it is very, very interesting topic that you are share, share with us today. But actually, it is very nice, it's very, very important. As you know, that the, I'm one of the I'm together with Professor Safi as a uh, technical advisor to Geopark uh, Lembah Kinta, actually the Kinta Valley Geopark. Yes. Actually, we are dealing with cars. Uh, yes. And then, uh, actually, the, it's quite interesting thing that I, I'm not... Can I have some... Get, uh, any I other got, not get the answer. Anybody, anybody else? Okay. Hello? Yes, I'm hearing you. Okay. Uh, actually, the, 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 the formation that I found in Gundurapat, actually, it's like a termite. Like a termite. It's very hard. Uh, actually, combination with the iron as well. Uh, I don't Excuse know what, 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 what kind of things there. Uh, do you have any ideas on that? Yeah. Sorry. Say again. We said it's, it's the, the, the the formation is looks like a termite. You know the termite with the holes and so on. Go actually uh, like a termite termite uh, uh, nest. But uh, uh, but I don't know actually what what the kind of formation there. Don't worry, you are not a, not a, you are not the only one who doesn't know it. I don't know it either. Okay, I okay, came okay right. just just to see beautiful caves. Somehow the seems the caves in the tropics are much better, maybe because the temperature is much higher. The chemical processes are maybe ten or hundred times faster than in the temperate zone in the high Alps where Dominic Dojvan works, and that could be maybe this is this is the place to study these. Uh, these cavity forming processes, not the temper, not the US, not Europe, not Poland, not Austria. This is a place, Malaysia, Vietnam, Indonesia, and such places are the best, Th and Thailand, of course. Yes, this is. But okay, we, thank we, you very much. Thank you very much, Prof. Thank you. If there's, if there's anybody else to, 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 to have a question or else before we uh, conclude this uh, session, the secretary asked us to on your uh, video for uh, 
photography session. Please, everyone, uh, on your your video. Uh, okay. Uh, kita akan mulakan. Siapa uh, dia sekretariat tadi? Boleh, boleh cakap? Uh, Encik Carol. Encik Carol akan ambil gambar. Saya akan kira perang. Ya. Dalam kiraan. Satu, uh, dua, tiga. Okay, Prof. Terima kasih, Prof. First of all, I, I, I would like uh, to thank you, uh, our guest, Professor Kazmer, uh, for willing to wait for his departure to Bali today, uh, just to give us some of his op opinion on something which we de didn't really look at, we take for granted, mostly, especially on the cave. We just listen to the speleologists uh, and sometimes to the biologists not really from the geological geologist point of view. I think uh, I I learned quite a lot from him uh, from from you, uh, Prof. Uh, uh, thank you very much for choosing Malaysia as part of your uh, new uh, adventure. Uh, you are a very adventurous guy. You, you, you do a lot of other subjects than paleontology yourself. <laughs> uh, Hopefully that you can come again and again to Malaysia and uh, give us more to, uh, uh, your, more of your experience uh, and le lectures and on your experience and so on. Uh, and on uh, for the organizer, sorry about, sorry about the short short notice. I only confirmed with Prof Kazmir uh, about two weeks ago. So I asked if you can have this this session thank you very much for allowing us uh, to share our our our, our uh, uh, stories on uh, hypogenic cast uh, cast and uh, sea spouts I, I since uh, you talk about uh, hot springs i just asked uh, dr hariri just now thank you dr hariri for uh, Giving uh, me, um, giving Prof. Miklos, Prof. Prof. Uh, Kazmi, I, I used, to call, used to call him Miklos, uh, Prof. Kazmi, uh, his two publications uh, for, uh, for you to read on uh, hot spring in Peninsula Malaysia. Dr. Hariri, thank you very much, Dr. Hariri. Thank you. And thank you for, for all, uh, everybody. Uh, I think we, we, we stop here uh, until we meet again next time. Uh, hope for all the best for everybody and uh, Prof. Miklos, uh, have a good journey to Bali tonight or this, uh, this evening. Uh, thank, you. thank you also to uh, his companion, uh, Mr. Rikza. I, sorry, I didn't, I didn't uh, introduce you all. Uh, his future students from Universitas uh, Institute uh, Technology uh, Lampung, Sumatera, Sumatera Lampung, New Institute. I know a few uh, of our ex UKM student is uh, is there as a lecturer there, according to uh, Mr. Rixa. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Miklos and Rixa. Uh, Rixa has uh, accompanied us uh, in, uh, during our two, three, four days field trip uh, yesterday. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Say thank you. Goodbye, everybody. I think we can end the session. Uh, any any other question? You can just email uh, Prof. Miklos or Prof. Kazmir. Sorry again. Or you can ask send it to me. Or uh, I didn't see Dr. Kamal here. <laughs> Maybe he, he, he was not around. Dr. Chazis. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Okay. Terima kasih Profesor Moretus, uh, Dr. Uh, Moshafi di atas moderator untuk sesi ini. Uh, jadi uh, terima kasih sekali lagi Prof dan thank you so much Prof Miklos. Miklos, I uh, hope we will uh, meet again. Thank you Hanida. Oh, thank you Prof. Puan Hanida. <laughs> okay Prof, terima kasih. Sama-sama. Sama-sama. Thank you. Okay. Michael.